Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ashley Soa. I'm a user services librarian for McGraw-Hill, and I'll be facilitating this webinar today with our special guest, Dr. Carlotta A. Berry. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. All of your lines are muted, so please use the Q&A box that you'll see on the bottom of your screen to type in any questions that you have. If you're having any technical issues, we can help troubleshoot through that Q&A box and that's also where you can enter your questions for either me or for Dr. Barry during our Q&A portion of the presentation. And I'll be monitoring that again so you can enter your questions at any time and I'll be sure to pass those along. This presentation is brought to you by McGraw-Hills Access Engineering, which is an award-winning engineering reference and teaching platform that delivers world-renowned interdisciplinary engineering content integrated with analytical teaching and learning tools. During the current COVID-19 crisis, we are offering free institutional access to the platform. So if you're interested in checking if your institution has access or want to set up that access, again, you can use that Q&A box to communicate that to me, and I'll be sure to follow up with you on setting that up. And now into the presentation, I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Carlotta A. Berry, who is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. She has a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Spelman College, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology, a master's in electrical engineering from Wayne State University, and a PhD from Vanderbilt University. She is one of a team of faculty in ECE, ME, and CSSE at Rose Holman to create and direct the first multidisciplinary minor in robotics. She is the co-director of the NSF STEM Rose Building Undergraduate Diversity Program and advisor for the National Society of Black Engineers. She is also the president of the Technical Editor Board for the ASWE Computers and Education Journal. She has taught undergraduate courses in human robotic interaction, mobile robotics, circuits, controls, signals and systems, freshman and senior design. Her research interests are in robotics education, interface design, human robot interaction, and increasing underrepresented populations in STEM fields. Welcome and thank you for being with us, Carlotta, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Ashley, so much for that wonderful introduction. And I would also like to thank McGraw-Hill for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about my experiences teaching engineering in a remote format. I would like to start by stating that I am absolutely not an expert in this area, and I'm learning along with the rest of you. But I just wanted to share a little bit of some of the lessons I've learned along the way, as well as how access engineering has helped to support my teaching in doing that. So first, a little bit about myself. I've been teaching electrical engineering for about 17 years, and I've been teaching engineering online for about the last seven, including classes in engineering design, circuits, signals and systems, and controls. I have taught these courses to high school as well as college students. For high school students, I've taught engineering design by using an Arduino microcontroller and a SparkFun Inventor Kit where they've used those to build robots, to build electronic designs such as LEDs, color mixers, and things like that. I've also taught classes online with and without a lab. So one of the main questions I get from faculty is, how do you teach engineering online without a lab? So I will talk a little bit about that. I've also taught these online courses in synchronous as well as asynchronous lectures. Synchronous meaning that I would log on and use PowerPoint or some other resource to teach the students in real time. And I've also done asynchronous lectures where I've recorded the videos in advance, put them on YouTube. The students would watch them and then log in with me in order to have office hours about what they saw in the videos. My goal is to provide the same quality of instruction as my face-to-face -face courses. We know this will not be 100% ideal, but I try to do this the best that I can. Some ways that I do that is to try to still make the course just as fun and engaging without sacrificing learning objectives, although we are learning remotely. So about access engineering, I like to use access engineering because I feel that it contains trusted, peer-reviewed, and edited content in the form of videos, tutorials, spreadsheet calculators, data visualization, and sub supplemental problems. 
In the spirit of full disclosure, I know that it's trusted content because I've created some of it. I've created some of the videos and some of the tutorials. And I also share this with my students that if they're looking for resources outside of class to get help, you can go and use things that I know have been peer-reviewed and that they are trusted. Because students, when they're looking for help, they will go to YouTube and they will go to online resources, but you don't always know the quality of what they're getting in that instruction. But by, So by pointing to them to things that I have curated, I know that they're getting good content. I've used access engineering for my face-to-face -face as well as my online courses. Sometimes you get students in class who as soon as they took the final in their previous course, they forget everything they learned, and I need them to review some of their prerequisite material. I have found that access engineering has a plethora of information so that if I'm teaching circuits, I can have them go back and review physics content or calculus content or linear algebra, et cetera. And so I love to use access engineering for that. I also use access engineering for homework problems. Unfortunately, as we know, a lot of students these days have access to textbook solution manuals or they can go to CHEG or other such websites. So I sometimes will get problems from access engineering just so that they can have something that they don't already have the solutions for in advance. We all know that there is some quality learning that happens when you are able to look at something where you can't reverse engineer from the answer. I've also used access engineering to get quiz questions, and I can also point them to things they can use to link to, to learn from before they take the quiz. And finally, I've used access engineering to support or replace the textbook. Unfortunately, we've all taught those courses that just did not have a, a quality textbook or one that the faculty liked. For example, my robotics class did not have a textbook that was appropriate for multidisciplinary robotics at an undergraduate level, so I'm able to supplement those courses with content from Access Engineering. So my online course that I'm teaching this quarter is actually controls. I have never taught controls online before, although I have taught circuits, circuits and signals and systems and access and um, the other courses. So I was able to support the class, which quickly had to be deployed within a week, as we probably all had to do that, by using content from Access Engineering. So my course uses the Moodle Learning Management System, and I have asynchronous course lectures on YouTube. So I will show you just a snippet from one of mine. I'm actually showing you one from my mobile robotics course, which is actually a flipped course. So in this course, the students actually watch the video lectures about robotics, and then when they come to class, they implement what we've discussed on the robot. So here I would discuss the theory. They would take a quiz on that theory, and then when they come to class, they have to show me things like they have now implemented on their robot how to do different artificial intelligence things, such as um, have a robot follow a wall, avoid obstacles, follow light, map the world, do localization, etc. So other things I do for my online courses is we have Microsoft Teams or Zoom synchronous class meetings. So if they've already watched the lectures, my now synchronous meeting is really more about holding office hours. So we'll discuss what they watched in the video, we'll talk about homework problems, we'll discuss any questions they missed on the quiz, we'll help get them ready for the exam, or if there's just anything technically that they want to discuss. One thing I learned quickly is that by putting up a discussion board in my LMS and asking them to post problems, offline that me or their peers could answer, nobody ever posted to the board. And I learned pretty quickly is it was because it was not anonymous. So I then learned about Piazza. Piazza is a way to foster this peer instruction and discuss, discussion with anonymous posts. Once I went to Piazza, which is actually a free Q&A platform, all of a sudden students started posting and talking to each other and posting problems and collaborating. So I learned it was not that they didn't want to do it, they didn't want to do it where their peers could see their name. So once I, I did that, I saw that my engagement on them collaborating with each other versus always coming to me as the giver of the knowledge really ramped up. I've had students this quarter tell me what they miss most about being at school is being able to study with their peers, talk to their friends, sit around a table and do their homework together. So providing them with opportunities to do that via video or Piazza was really important. And so we talked about the weekly concept quizzes on Moodle for me to gauge how the lectures were going. Their exams are written and they then used their cell phone or their computer to scan them and upload them. And for these timed exams, I currently am using Microsoft Teams. I actually had one yesterday. 
and the students turn on their video camera and they mute themselves and we open up the chat for them to ask questions and I'm able to watch them through the videos as they complete the exam and then they take pictures of it and they upload it in a certain amount of time. For my class, it was 90 minutes. As far as the labs, for circuits labs, we've used multi-SIM, the NI MIDAC, Digilent boards, and the virtual instrumentation they get by plugging it into their laptop, such as a multimeter, oscilloscope, power supply, et cetera. For the controls labs this quarter, we had to convert from the hardware quickly so they do all of their labs using MATLAB, Simulink, and CISO tool, as well as watching YouTube videos. And I will say that Kwanzaa also now has some interactive control labs that you can do for free online. So for access engineering, I love to use the Shalms outlines of books because I used those about 25 years ago when I was a college student, and I found them invaluable. But now they're way more than just the text. There's actually videos embedded. So, for example, I can have the students go and watch a video from the Shalms outline problems on stability, and then after doing that, I can give them either a quiz or homework question on it. So here's an example of a video that I actually created on using the Ralph Hurwitz criterion in order to determine if a characteristic equation is for a stable or an unstable system. So the great thing about this is it has captions. It shows the exact screenshot from the problem. It also provides the theory from the textbook so that the students understand before we start the foundational theory for what we're going to do. And then after that, I walk them through the solution process. So the student would watch something like this, and then once they complete it, in order to measure their level of understanding, I could give them a quiz question from this exact same textbook on this content. So if we go to the problem, there are Shams as well as other textbooks with this content in it. The Shams ones, because they're more like a tutorial or support, what you'll see those, the student would actually, for example, solve problem 5.31 using the Ralph Hurwitz criterion. And then after they determine the gain K that causes either a stable or unstable system, right down here at the bottom, they can check their work. This tests their understanding of what they saw in the video. Like I said, there are some texts that have solutions and answers and some that do not. So as long as the students have the access to all of these, I can then give them homework as well. So for example, if we were doing convolution in class, I could have them do the lecture and do the homework after watching a convolution video as well. So this is giving them multiple sources of information on the same thing that I would have taught them in class. So here's an example of a convolution video from Shown's outline for signals and systems. And I will say that I also created this one as well. And so here is me walking them through how to do the flip and slide method to do convolution as well as how to solve a convolution problem just by evaluating the integral. And then after they complete this video, and of course they get to watch the video as many times as they would like, we would then go back in here and I would assign a homework problem on this. And the homework problem, they would then typically write out a full solution process on engineering paper, take a photo of it or an image of it, and then upload that to the website. So here's an example of a homework problem I would then give them after they watch that video. And they're normally right next to it. So you see here problem 2.48 is a homework problem. And if you need any help, you can go right back up to that video and watch it again because they're all embedded together. So videos are the first thing that I use Access Engineering for. The other thing I use Access Engineering for are tutorials. So another controls book is Automa Automatic Control Systems by Go Naragi and Quo. So I want to show you the textbook and then how I can quickly get to the things I need directly from the textbook. So here we have the textbook for this control systems right here in Access Engineering. And if you notice here, if I click on the videos link, it immediately shows me that there are two videos associated with this textbook on PID controller design and lead controller design. Then if I click on the figures, it shows me every figure in the textbook and it also would show me other resources in the textbook as well. So there's these zip packages that have been included with MATLAB and Simulink problems that I could download and have the students do as well. But one thing I'm going to show you today is a tutorial. So what you'll see here is 
If a student wants another way of learning about this material, they can do a step-by-step -step tutorial, and I actually helped create these as well. So this problem is from the textbook, and it says to design a forward path transfer function for a unity feedback control system, select the values for K and tau to get a certain overshoot and time to peak. So I have now added this content so they understand the objective is for you to understand proportional control and how to just select gains and a tau for a plant. Then I walked them through a game plan for how to do that. So this would be available on Access Engineering, and it's the steps. So at any point, a student who understands or does not understand can abandon the tutorial and try it on their own, but if they need a little bit more help, they can then go to step one. Step one is to determine how to find the closed loop transfer function. And so they would then do those steps, and if they want to check they work, their work, the answer would be here. Then step two would be to find the transfer function, to determine the formula for finding time to peak, and use equations from the text to get these values. They can write this out by hand, and then if they want to check they work, their work, they could click the Show Me button, and it would give them the answer so they can confirm it's correct. So this tutorial walks them through every step of the problem, and they try it first, and then after you try it, you can check to see if your answer is correct. If you're doing okay based upon the game plan, you can keep going. But if you still need help, you can click on every step in this process and then keep clicking through with the Show Me buttons. When they get to the very end, there is a summary of the entire solution along with the answer, as well as once again reiterating how they got there, as, long as, as well as some hints such as you may want to check your work. One way you could check your work is using MATLAB. So it then gives you the MATLAB code and shows you the output and how you confirm that your answer was correct based upon the MATLAB. And then finally, other references on access engineering that discuss things such as how to design a proportional control system, second order prototype systems, and maximum overshoot. So I would walk them through that, and then after that, they would get a homework problem on it. So once again, here's an example of a homework problem where they would then design a proportional controller. Um, and they can refer back to that tutorial as many times as they would like to help them to solve that problem. I have found um, when I've taught in the past that if I provide content like this on Access Engineering and then I later on give a homework problem that does not have an associated tutorial or video, I've actually had students say, hey, can we get a video to help? Or can you give me some of that other content? So I found that they became accustomed to having this multimedia approach to solving these problems such that if I just said, here's a problem in your book, can you go do it? They would say, hey, can you provide either a video or a tutorial or something to help to support that learning? Of course, you do want to get them to the point by the time they get to the exam that they can do it just by seeing a problem from scratch. But any of these resources that are helpful while they're doing their homework and their study time are ideal. So here's just another example of one that uses state variable feedback in order to solve a problem, in order to place the closed, the closed loop poles at a certain location. Once again, it has objective, the game plan, and then it walks them through each of the steps. First, you have to assign the states on your, feed, your block diagram, and then after you assign those states, you want to calculate values such as the closed loop transfer function, the equation, et cetera. So there's actually one more type of resource that I use a lot in um, Access Engineering, and they're called spreadsheet calculators. And so just like they sound, they are Excel spreadsheets where the students can go in and actually play with different values and see how they affect systems or use them in order to learn a little bit about controls or, or circuits concepts. So there are two spreadsheet calculators that I want to show you today. One of them is based upon the Shoms outline of electric circuits. And if you go here and you click on this text, similar to the one that I just showed you, when the text opens up, you will see all of the different things that are available for that book, um, including you can have the, the table of contents, and there are 25 videos for this one. But then there's another resource that you can click on that will actually show you the spreadsheet calculator. So here I want to show you how to get to those as well. So when you click on this one, for circuit analysis, and this is just a matter of doing a search in Access Engineering, where you search on the spreadsheet calculators using circuit analysis. So it will give me that there were four spreadsheets based on circuit analysis, AC and DC circuits, inductance, capacitance, resonance, and time constants, 
antennas and transmission lines, and then, of course, the control system analysis. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this last one as well as that first one. So when I click here, let's say I'm a student and I want to learn a little bit more about KCL and KVL. The great thing about this website is it gives you a little bit of a review of the theory. So in this page here, it gives you a little bit about the theory. And then over here on the left, it shows you the equations that you would use to use KVL or mesh current method in order to solve this circuit as well as to get the inverse. So this one is a passive page, but there are actually some more active pages as well. So here's an example of an active page where the students would actually type in a voltage and a current and get the resistance using Ohm's law, or they could use P equals I squared R, put in power and current and get resistance, or put in voltage and power and get resistance. And then there's also some for series circuits here where you could get impedances by putting in the resistance and the reactance for an inductor or a capacitor. And there's also some that look at AC circuits over here as well. So you now could um, find frequency from period. You could do cyclic frequency as well as, you know, radians per second and things like that. So I could have the students go and play in the spreadsheet calculator, and then I could, for example, give them a problem and say, can you use the spreadsheet calculator to either solve this problem or to help you to get to the answer? So here's an example of what one looks like for the controls. So here we have a spreadsheet that has a plant K over tau S plus 1. So the students can come in here and they can change the value of K. They could change the value of the time constant. And they can look at what happens when you try to get this system to then track a ramp. And you can look at things like steady state error and that a first order system cannot track a ramp or a type 0 system cannot track a ramp. And you can see here what your steady state error is, et cetera. Um, you could also change it to a different plant. For example, you could come down here and use this one, change the numeric values, and then look and see that you're now getting a system with zero steady state error. And so you could have the student do this, make sure that they understand how all of these systems work and respond to a step response. So here you have a second order system with no damping, and you could look at what happens when you increase the damping ratio as it goes from under damp to over damp to critically damped and things like that. And as usual, over here on the right, you have theory so that they understand where this comes from. So here's a tab on steady state error where the steady state error is shown up here as the student changes from a type 0 to a type 1, a type 2 system. You can look at how the poles affect stability as well. So as they slide the poles, like for example, they could put in positive 0.2 instead. So you now are going to have poles in the right half plane, and you see now we are getting an unstable system. And once again, here's the routh Hurwitz criterion like we just saw in the video. Here's your theory, and they can look at how they can put in the values for there. So this spreadsheet just became a support for them on their homework. It's something a little bit more than just a calculator because it has theory, and it has ways for them to play around with it in order to just determine how the system responds to that. There's a spreadsheet um, calculator for analysis as well as design. I won't show you the design calculator today, but that one actually helps the students to do PID control design, lead and lag controller design in the frequency domain as well as by using root locus. So some of the lessons I've learned. Um, it's important to coach students throughout the process the importance to be focused and disciplined when learning online. Very important this quarter because students signed up for a face-to-face -face class and they now are taking it online. And they're like, man, this is hard, this is really difficult. And I tell them, if a class is semi-difficult face-to-face, it becomes much more difficult online because you have got to be disciplined, especially when you're all now at home with all your distractions. So it's very important throughout the process to be supportive, and to continually ask how they're doing, how they're managing, and what they need to do. I've actually given some of my students an Excel spreadsheet that lays out their day from eating, sleeping, studying, classing, et cetera, going to class, et cetera, in order to help them to be more disciplined in this online world. 
I try to make attendance mandatory at virtual office hours. I know all of them won't be able to make it, but I try to do the best I can. And I keep mine the same as what their campus class time would be, although they're now all at home and in different time zones. And I have found that by doing this, I have more students coming to office hours in study group than I think they would if we were on campus because they now recognize the need to engage with their peers and me more than ever. I also found that in this online environment, they don't want to verbally answer questions, although we're on video together. So I ask a lot of polls in the chat window, and I ask questions in the chat window. For example, I may have a poll that goes, how is everyone doing today? And I put a happy face, a straight face, and a sad face, kind of like back in kindergarten. But I noticed they were more willing to click on that poll than to just answer me about how they were doing today. The chat window is also extensively used for things like, hey, what's the answer to the question I'm doing right now? And they'll start typing in the chat window the answer, even though when I asked verbally, no one answered me. I also try to respond to all questions in all formats within 24 hours. So whether it's on the discussion board or an email or a private message inside of Microsoft Teams, I try to get back to them within a day. Although in face-to-face -face they could handle a little bit more time, I notice online they become pretty anxious, like, okay, there's somebody out in the world, I need help with this. And I think the discussion board is great for that because now their peers can jump in and say, hey, I got number three, I can help you with that if the professor's not back yet. Some other things I've tried to get them to more engage with me in Microsoft Teams is I try to be flexible and have a sense of humor. Don't take yourself so seriously. So in my class, every Monday at the beginning of class, we do a group sing-along. The first week, they were rather quiet. We did um, Backstreet Boys, um, and they actually were socially distancing at an iHeartRadio concert. So I played it and showed them all in their living room singing. So we were supposed to sing along. The first week, I was the only one singing. But then after it was over, they secretly started sending me song requests for future weeks in the chat window. So I knew that it was working. Some other things I am thinking of trying is a STEM-based joke to start class. You know, a, a corny dad's joke about STEM, like when you go out with a light bulb, why do all the light bulbs come? And that's because when one goes out, they all go out. Or best video background contest, because a lot of them I notice don't want to turn their videos on. Um, so I'm looking at a, a window full of icons usually. So maybe if I try something like best video background contest, people will start to turn on their videos. Other theme dates could be days could be like best hat in the video day or talk like a pirate or chat like a pirate um, on themes as well. And I think most importantly is to say, know that you are not alone. And I know this is a difficult time for faculty, staff, and students who are all of a sudden socially distancing and everyone is learning online and we can all learn from each other. One of the favorite, my favorite things to do is to go to Twitter and go to academic chatter and academic Twitter and kind of see what other people are doing and learning and things that I can integrate in my class. For example, that best video um, background I got from Twitter from somebody else posting that. So in conclusion, I think that McGraw-Hill and Access Engineering have a lot of great options for homework and quiz questions and for learning online. And I think one of the best things about it is it's trusted supplemental instruction. And it's great for prerequisite review or helping students with muddy points and topics. One of the things I like is the diverse multimedia content. So that's hopefully helpful for different types of learners, whether they're active or reflective. And it's also, which I didn't mention, a wonderful resource for capstone project research as well as for professionals. I've had students reach out to me after graduation who are preparing to take the PE or the EIT or FE exams, and they want to keep using some of my content or my videos or things from the past, and I point them to resources such as this in order to get assistance with that. So with that, I am actually done with my presentation. I want to thank you for listening. And I now welcome any questions. Thank you, Carlotta, so much for that. And again, if you want to type your questions into the Q&A box now for Carlotta, and I will read those out um, as they come in to her. So we have one question in there already, which is about how do we know what supplemental information there is on our specific topic in Access Engineering? So Carlotta, okay. do you mind jumping over to Access Engineering That's and just great. showing that? Glad um, you asked that. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, did the did the um, questioner actually mention a topic I could actually search on for them, or uh, I they can did just not? Pick but one? if you okay. want to mention <laughs> um, a topic, let's say 
I'll do electromagnetics because I have no idea. So I'm just picking one here. So notice that it has the type ahead. So that's another way you can kind of tell if there's content because it will actually start to auto-finish your search for you. So, for example, if I type electromagnetics and I go to a search, it's going to search all of access engineering. But then if some content comes up that I like, I can then pare it down. So if I do electromagnetics, it brings up all of these different books, like there's a Shams on electromagnetics. There's also other texts. And right across the top, it tells me that there's a book on it, there's videos on it, and there's no spreadsheets. I didn't talk about data visualization, but there's also certain topics that do data visualization, and there's certain topics that have case studies. So, for example, if you're a civil engineer, I believe some of the case studies are under civil engineering. Um, so I'll do a search and see if a case study comes up. And I think the data visualization content is under chemical engineering. Civil engineering is a pretty big topic, um, but notice here there's a tutorial for, for um, civil engineering. So if I click on that, it will show me a couple of the tutorials. So here are some of the spreadsheets on that. And then data visualization like I said, was the topic that I did not show you. So if I click here, hopefully it's coming up in a minute. It's my internet, by the way. It's not access engineering. And so explore material properties using data viz. Um, I'm going to try to open this up. In full disclosure, I'm an electrical engineer, so I don't know a lot about data visualization, but we can take a look and see what's in here. So hopefully that's enough for me to answer your question without me knowing exactly what your topic is. So if you come in here, it gives you, you can compare properties across multiple materials, find a property value for a single material, and here's your data visualization library. Okay. Is there another question, Ashley? Um, okay, one person has asked about specific topics. How about systems engineering? Okay, all right. I will go back to systems engineering. Um, that seems kind of broad as well, but I'll type it in and let's see what comes up. This is an adventure. Oh, look, right on top. Okay, so here's systems engineering. I'm going to do a search there, and we'll see what comes up. So it looks like a circuits book came up. That's interesting. Um, modeling devices with varying parameters. That's circuits as well. Um, all of these are circuits, so I'm not sure if that's what you meant by it says, oh, I'm sorry. I think I was in within selection. Okay, ignore that. Ignore that. Sorry. I think I was in a subheading. Sorry, whoever asked me that question. Let me let me take this off and try it again. So I think it's search, but because I had this picked as a subtopic, it was trying to find it inside of what I had there. This will probably get – here we go. Here are better results for systems engineering. So um, we have this text here, Global Kata, and Supportability Engineering Handbook. Um, there is another text by Ralph on it, and then there's topics on reliability. And if you come across the top, you're going to need to narrow down systems engineering, obviously, because 31,000 book hits. But you do get 53 videos, two spreadsheets, three case studies, two tutorials, and a data viz. So I hope that's enough um, for you to be able to go in there and play around on whatever subtopic in systems engineering you were interested in. Do we have another question, Ashley? Uh, yes, I'm seeing a couple come in here, so let me see um, what else we have here. Okay, there. Um, sorry, the questions are coming. <laughs> There's a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to sort through them. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. I'm that's excited okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and some questions about access that, that are for me that I need to answer. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I can follow up, too, with the people asking questions about specific disciplines. I can follow up with you as well with a list of some specific things there as well. Okay. I'll keep the window open. Um, and let me know. Yeah, so there was a question about um, the videos to access engineering, because you had mentioned sort of creating some of those videos. So can you talk maybe a little bit about how that process went? Yes, absolutely. So what I did is I actually have a blue snowball um, microphone in my home, or, you know, you can also use a headset microphone, and I have a tablet. So what I would do is I went through the textbook, and I would try to find problems that students sometimes struggle with. Like, for example, when I teach circuits, Thevenin and Norton equivalent is always a big one that they really struggle with understanding. So I would solve the problems out by hand, and then I would record myself by using Camtasia Studio, 
where I would verbally talk out the problem-solving process while I wrote it out on the tablet. Um, I will tell you that that's pretty identical to how I teach um, in real time, in face-to-face -face class as well. I am actually facing the students when I teach at Rose Holman, and I put um, a study guide, which is partial lecture notes, on a dot cam, so it has blanks in it, so the students are paying attention to get the blanks, and I verbally walk through the problem-solving process as I write it out. So when they're watching a video and they still have the partial lecture notes that they were provided with before they went home on the quarantine, they are able to walk through and complete their notes as I verbally um, solve those problems. But I obviously did the circuit signals and systems and controls problems, so there are other um, videos in here as well by other um, faculty. So I was actually trying to find one that's not one that I authored so that you can see that you know there's also these design problems as well um, by other faculty who do different approaches. So although I use the Camtasia and I write them out, here's one of a faculty member showing how to use Autodesk to do design. So not all of them are this verbal kind of written out instruction like I do. Other questions? Yeah. Um, one just came in. Um, my students have had access to access engineering available to them for a couple of years, but short of direct homework assignments, I don't see them using it as an open resource. So what kind of things have you done that have resulted in students actually using access engineering outside of an assignment? So um, I found it is really hard to get students to use something if it's not tied to an assessment. Um, like I said, the only time that I was able to get them to do it even if it wasn't something graded, is for me to say something such as, if you watch this video at this link, it will really help you with the exam or with your quiz or with your homework. So although they could do it and it wasn't graded, it had to, that they, that's what motivates them. I hate to say it, but a lot of that, that's what motivates them. The only time I think you could get that is I also teach senior design. Senior design students are hungry for that kind of information. So especially if there's a part of the project that none of them have done. Like I teach multidisciplinary senior design. So these are teams of students from mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, computer science, and software engineering. Part of the requirement for their class is they have to do self-directed learning. It's also part of their ABET requirement. So in, in their self-directed learning, they have to pick something that they teach themselves by the end of the quarter. They're willing to go to Access Engineering because they know I need a trusted resource to learn something that I've never learned before, and it's not in any of my prior classes, and it's probably not in a textbook. So you have to tie it to something, even if it's not a grade. That's how I have found it. They've either got to be excited and they want to learn it, or it's got to be tied to an assessment. Other okay, questions? We have an, yeah, we have another question. Oh, um, can you show the instructor resources really quickly? You sort of showed that a little bit, but can you maybe show, um, you know, the grayed out ones at the bottom that are available only to instructors? Oh, I don't remember showing that. Um, did I show that? Yeah, the, the zip files, remember, on the control. Oh, oh okay, okay. i got to remember how I got there. Sorry, please be patient with me. I think it was Golden Ragi. Okay, let, let, let me go back for a minute. i got to go find the book. Okay, I remember where it was. Thank you, Ashley. Sorry. I was like, I don't think I showed that, but I guess I did. So it was. You're on within selection again. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ashley. It's me, guys. It's not Ashley. Okay, so if I click on the, so if I click on the book, um, it then shows me all the content available in this book. Um, even though it says instructor resources, and this may be something Ashley has to answer, can students see this if they click on it or no? Yeah, so I'll jump in here. So the page that you're on now, those resources in blue are available to anyone. So students can yeah. come in and get those. Um, but then if you scroll a little bit further down, you can see, oh, I see it. there are right out. two okay. that are grayed out. Yep. And then right below that, there are instructions for how to get that turned on for you. So okay. if you're an instructor, yeah. um, you basically you register for a personal account, you fill out a form, and then you'll be able to download those instructor resources for any title on the site. And we do vet that through user services so that we're making sure that students aren't getting access to that. So you can see there's solutions manuals available there, so you can be pretty confident that students, you know, aren't just requesting access to that and then getting it. We do vet that. Right. 
Right. And so the great thing about this controls book is I told I think I mentioned I also teach robotics. So this controls book actually has content on robotics as well. So if you notice some of the things you can download are about doing um, robot Lego labs, like our freshman design class used to use um, Lego robots. So these could be some things that we could have those students um, review in order to do the um, freshman design project using a Lego robot. Okay, so sorry about that. I forgot I showed this. So hopefully that no, answers okay. those questions. Um, I have another question here about um, how you sort of plug resources into your LMS from mcgraw -Hill. Now, that one I have not – the only way I have to do it is I have to hyperlink into Access Engineering. So I just put in a URL. There's no way if you're asking about full integration right now of um, Access Engineering – into it. So like, in other words, the only thing I could track in Moodle, for example, is that the students are actually clicking on the links and who's going and watching the resources. But I have to just do it as a URL. So it's similar to how in the PowerPoint I have these um, links that I had that go directly to a certain problem. I would actually create a link like in their homework or in, inside of my LMS that links directly to the problem that I want them to look at or, or links directly to the video that I want them to watch. Other questions? Okay, let me see what other questions we have, if I've missed any here. Um, there have been some questions that I'll just address about um, sort of access on the site, um, because it seems like a lot of people are familiar with Connect, which is a McGraw-Hill product that's tied to a specific textbook. But mm -hmm. Access Engineering is sort of just a database platform. So if your institution has a subscription, you have access to absolutely everything that you've seen on the site today. So you, all the textbooks, um, everything that Carlotta has shown, all of those additional tools you have access to. I think while, while you're looking for questions, I can also do a case study because I think that was the one thing I didn't show. Um, so, so for example, here, here are some examples of case studies. Continuous and those are right now monitoring. just for um, biomedical. We have a couple. So it's for biomedical case studies. So um, this may also be something that's more appropriate for, um, I don't well, you know, I don't want to say, but maybe like a design class or something where you go through case studies and then discuss them or discuss the ethics and things like that. So that's also another content that I didn't show. Okay, any other questions? I haven't seen any new ones come in, um, again, other than the ones I have to follow up with afterwards about access. Um, but any other questions for Carlotta about any of the resources, anything with teaching remotely? I'll just put my last slide back up here again. So please feel free to um, send me an email, or um, you can go look at my website. I do have some of the content on there that I give to the students. I don't know if I have my homework sets up there, but just so you can kind of just see what my study guide looks like that I use for the lectures and how that is very closely related to the videos that I create and things like that. Okay, well, thank you so much. This was really cool, and I really appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to share with you some of my adventures in teaching, and I wish us all the best out there as we all learn to journey through this remote teaching and learning together. And thanks, McGraw-Hill, for again, giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Carlotta, for giving this presentation today. Thank you for everyone on the line. Thanks for your questions. Um, if you have additional questions, I will make sure that we follow up with everybody who still had questions in there about access. Um, and yeah, just hope everyone stays safe out there. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.